Welcome to the Market Maker Podcast, hosted by me, Anthony Chung, where every Friday I talk to a member of the team about what happened in markets this week. From macro themes and single stock news to cryptocurrencies and careers in finance, our aim is simple, to make finance interesting and easy to understand for everyone. So let's get to it. Okay, hello and welcome to episode 82 of The Market Maker. And this week, we're going to talk about banker bonuses. I think whenever you see those headlines hit the news sphere, you're always a little bit interested to know what's going on here. And there has been an update from the newly elected UK government. So we're going to delve into that and talk a little bit about banker bonuses. We're also going to talk about US CPI and the midweek collapse of the US stock market. Was that a one-off or is there something more sinister lurking in that inflation report that came out? And Piers, as ever, is joining me and he's going to delve into that and give his view. And then it is the 14th anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers this week on Thursday. So yesterday from when we were recording this. So both Piers and I are going to give one tale from back then that certainly comes to mind and I know there's plenty but hopefully we've picked one good one each but perhaps before we begin the biggest news Roger Federer hanging up the racket yeah I mean greatest of all time well in my in my humble opinion for for sure I think greatest of all time I know the stats I mean I don't know obviously the stats don't show that so he's, he's the greatest of all time in some respects. But, yeah, it's a bit sad, isn't it? I mean, it's a bit like, it's almost, dare I say, it's a little bit like the Queen passing. It's like <laughs> we knew it was going to happen. It probably has happened later than we thought. You know, he is 41 <laughs> after all, right? Mm. Um, but, yeah, for me, he's my greatest of all time. I know you're, and I, I know you don't agree with that. Well, look, you're a contrarian. Tim, Tim, Tim Hemman was an incredible <laughs> serve and volley player. He was very consistent, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but okay, yeah. still, I'm going to fire some numbers at you and then we'll play a guessing game. Okay. So, in his career, what yeah. do you think was the number of singles titles? <sighs> Okay, so not Grand Slams, just any sort of tour event. Ooh, yep. uh, God, I've got no idea. I'm going to go for um, 241. Wow. <laughs> he certainly would be the greatest of all time <laughs> if that were the but, case. Have I got a bit bullish there? <laughs> just a little. 100, <laughs> 103. Ah, uh, okay. 103. He's not okay. as good as I thought. So, so okay. Two more. Is that a record, 103? No, no, no. I don't think it is. I think it's, I think there's plenty more. I think Djokovic, Nadal, they've all got more than that, I think. Right, yeah. Um, how much did Federer earn all in in his first year as a professional tennis player, do you reckon? Well, he wasn't very good then, so I'm, and no one knew it. Well, he wasn't very good. He was a junior world number one. All right, okay. So <laughs> let me rephrase that. <laughs> He wasn't maybe not good in your world. He wasn't it? winning tournaments. So from a money earning point of view, he yeah, wasn't winning you've got, tournaments. You've got to win to earn, right? That's most terrible. of the world hadn't heard of him. He had no media sponsorship deals. So right. I'm I'm gonna say I'm gonna say and this is like early 2000s, I guess. So 20 years ago, probably more, right? So I'm gonna say I, I'm gonna say 78,000. Okay, well, before I give you the number, do you know, I think it was back in 99, possibly, he yeah. beat Pete Sampras. And that was uh, on Pete Sampras. That was a really pivotal point when uh, there was a changing of the guard, right? Yeah. He beat Sampras at Wimbledon. And right. Do you know who knocked Federer out then in the quarterfinal after Federer had beat Sampras? Um, Roddick. Tim Henman. No. What, beat oh, Federer yes. at Wimbledon? Yep. Is that right? God, that is the greatest moment of Tim Herman's life. <laughs> not not just his career. His life. But, but, okay. So you what was the figure you said? 70 78,000. 78,000. He earned 28,000 US dollars. Wow. 
Amazing. He probably earns that per second last year. So last year, um, his career earnings grew $129 million in one year. In the year. Yeah. In the year. <laughs> yeah. He's done all right. Yeah, he's you know. pretty good. <laughs> First tennis player to cross the billionaire mark. Right. Is that right? Is he a billionaire? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, greatest of all time then, right? Yeah. So, Roger, I know you're a big fan of the pod, so shout out. Much love. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you'll be a hedge fund manager or something of the sort. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is the um, the beginning of the next chapter, let's say. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, look, before we delve into the first topic, which is the banker bonuses, quick reminder, if you're a regular listener to the podcast or if you're listening for the first time and you enjoy the conversation, please do um, rate and review the podcast it really helps to get it out to as many people as possible i'm going to give you all a target i just had a quick look we're on 261 ratings on spotify let's get that up to 300 yeah. by the time piers and i talk next week i, I feel it's slowed a bit we need to, yeah we need to re-energize the community here come on guys because i know that definitely there's a lot more people that listen regularly than there is on that number so yeah it'd be amazing <laughs> if you could convert that into a rating it really helps but look let's talk about the first topic so the new uk chancellor has reportedly is planning to scrap the cap on bankers bonuses in a move to attract more talent to the city of london always a delicate <laughs> issue of course because we're in a cost of living crisis yeah people are struggling and you can imagine well even the post i did for social this morning of leo from wolf and wall street doing the dance <laughs> <laughs> like that's only gonna rile um the main street but for context right. that that what's happened here is the uk has long opposed what were eu bonus caps and essentially what that meant was it limited year end payouts to twice a banker's salary oh no <laughs> oh only only twice my salary as a bonus so before, before we like, we kind of discuss this a bit more so there's a couple of things here why is the government doing it firstly well it wants to approve the attractiveness of of london as a financial center and obviously, these are EU enforced or led rules. The other thing being, it's what they call a Brexit dividend, which is certainly you're trying to take on that, um, I, I guess, Boris led Brexit situation to appease certain camps, if yeah. you like. Ending a former EU rule is always seen as a, as a positive thing for the, the internal politics for a certain pocket of the Conservative Party. So that aside, though, let's talk a little bit more about um, the kind of structure of how these bankers get paid, because one of the headlines that I read in um, in the press only a week ago was that while we're sat here thinking, right, unlimited bonuses. Wow, this is like multi-million dollar <laughs> bonuses. There was a headline about a week ago, Goldman Sachs are going to cut several hundred jobs as of October several hundred yeah and a lot of that comes because of the fact that um we had a record-breaking year in terms of fees particularly in the investment banking division from last year however analysts now expect goldman's to post a more than 40 percent drop in earnings this year so maybe you could explain why such a big drop in their earnings is coming and then how the bank then takes action to control costs essentially yeah, so the you know a, a bank like Goldman, look, these banks are all they're not all different, but like you can't really compare like for like Goldman Sachs with Bank of America, for example. Um, you got you got I'd say, and actually we're going to talk about this is topical. We're going to talk about Lehman Brothers in a, in a minute in terms of the fourteenth anniversary and so on. But um, Goldman Sachs and and kind of Morgan Stanley. Are kind of the the last two kind of big guns of the what we used to call the broker dealers. Okay, we'll come on to that when we talk about Lehman's because Lehman was a broker dealer. But um, the point being that they're kind of historically they've come from an investment bank. You know, they, they are an investment bank. 
Um, they have sales and trading as, as well as their IBD divisions, but that's that's where they were born and that's their bread and butter and that's what they do. Um, they, they have much less of, although they're trying to address this, much less of the commercial or even retail banking arms that the big giant banks like Citigroup and Bank of America and HSBC and, you know, and JP Morgan have. Um, so I guess Goldman's are the biggest for IBD revenues, okay, bigger than any other bank, okay. Um, and then their sales and trading division is one of the biggest as well, competing with Morgan Stanley. So they're incredibly dependent as a business on these two revenue streams, okay. Now, in 2021, as you said, Goldman's IBD division just smashed it, best year ever. And that's because the deal flow was record, record off the scale levels. Deal flow meaning um, companies raising capital through either issuing shares, so it might be through an IPO, for example, or issuing bonds. So this is their equity and debt capital markets divisions. The volume was the record ever. Um, and then mergers and acquisitions were at a record ever level. So there were so many deals, and that's how they make money, obviously, they're providing a service to facilitate these deals and they charge a fee and the fees were through the roof. Okay. Fast forward to 2022, literally it's flipped entirely to the opposite end of the spectrum because the macro environment has collapsed. Investor appetite has collapsed. Um, and therefore companies, you know, uh, have pulled back from raising capital because it's going to be more expensive for them to raise. Okay, so if you can as a business, if you've got enough cash flow to just delay your next capital raise, then they're definitely sitting on the fence. Number of deals sharply, sharply lower. One perhaps one of the best stats in amongst all of them is the number of IPOs in the US this year so far is the least this century. You've got to go back to 1999 to find the last year with less IPOs. Okay, so that's just one kind of evidence. Um, so fees have collapsed probably 40%, right, on the IBD side. The, the trading side of Goldman's has done really well in the first half of the year. That, that division does really well when markets are volatile. It doesn't really matter if markets are going up or down. It's just volatility and huge volume on the trading side that translates into big fees for Goldman. So they've done really well on that front. Um, I'd say into the end of 2022, you're definitely going to see IBD fee fees remain incredibly subdued, certainly compared to last year's comp. Um, will the trading side of the bank, you know, continue to really motor and, and prop up the overall revenue figure? I don't know. Maybe it depends on what your view is. And we're, we're going to talk about this bear markets and bear market rallies. And, you know, is trading volume flow going to say stay really high or not? I think that's less, less, that, that's harder to predict. Um, so that, that's kind of on the fee side. So Goldman's then, I mean, how do you cut costs? Well, well, you know, the, the best way, and certainly for these types of companies, especially easily their highest cost is staff. Um, and that's typically the case for most companies as well. But if you're providing a service, right, which is what the IBD division is doing, you're providing a service, normally, you know, the, uh, you know, looking at your cost base, it's not like, I don't know, a manufacturing company, where you've got to pay for a factory, you've got to pay for, you know, um, components to build your product, you, you know, you've got a huge cost base, um, whereas banks or service providers generally have, have a narrower cost base and it normally means the salaries are higher and you're so the best way to cut costs is to cut people. Um, Goldman's, I would say, though, they have a history of this. They have been adding people. I mean, their workforce has risen. What was the stat you were telling me earlier? Yeah, so they they had 47,000 employees at the end of Q2 this year. That's compared with 39,000 just two years ago, and it's been aided predominantly by recent acquisitions, increasing right. their workforce. Okay, right, yeah, through acquisition. And look, they are trying to spin out um, like consumer banking kind mm. of platforms and so on. So they are trying to diversify and grow. And as you say, the acquisitions are obviously going to go straight onto the workforce total. But Goldman's historically used to do this thing 
where at the end of each year, they'd cut 5%. Used to do it. They, they kind of paused on that over the last few years. Oh, was this one of those cultural things to just try and keep you yes. honest in your role? It was. So at the end of every year, cut yeah. the 5% weakest, just yeah. cut the fat and rehire those five you know, new people in. And it's kind of, yeah. And you, as you say, the culture within the bank is, I mm. guess it's kind of, ruling by fear in many ways, right? You need to properly deliver, otherwise literally you're out. And I think that kind of culture, mm. I don't know, it's a bit old school and it's a bit cutthroat and perhaps what finance certainly used to be across the whole street. I think things have softened in mm. this day and age on that front, but this is where, this is really the Goldman's culture um, and it's about, hard work ethic high performance all the time if you're slightly off it you're out mm. and this and they're bringing it back basically i know the headlines seem quite alarming oh they've sacked hundreds of people and but, but i think they're just returning to their old model that's really just been on pause for a few years that 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 may be, i don't know the, and that, the old, that, is, old, that old model might as well be coming back because of the fact that you remember probably 12, 18 months ago, they had to increase all of the salaries, particularly of the lower level staff to yeah. compete with a reports of working conditions, let's call yeah. it, yeah. Um, which were, let's say, challenging on many different levels, but also through the competition, competition with other financial institutions and other sectors, namely technology as yeah. well. So their costs not only have they got more staff, they've got more expensive staff to compete with this current pretty insane labor market conditions yeah. that we have at the moment. But Goldman's can alter their staff costs quite radically by the level of bonuses they pay out. Mm. So, I mean, this is the original point of this conversation to kick off the pod was like bonuses and what's happening. And like in the US, there was no bonus cap, right? And so you could, you know, you last in 2021, I don't know what the bonuses were, but <laughs> yeah. let me tell you, they were very large. Okay. What are the bonuses going to be like this year? There aren't going to be any bonuses. Well, I guess this is a slight issue for the bank. Can they literally just go, look, performance has been really bad relative to last year. Zero bonuses for everyone. They should do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right? They Pay no bonuses when Surely it's not going well. <laughs> Pay bonuses when it is. They should do that, but they can't. Yeah. Because if you literally go zero, people are just going to leave. Yeah. I'll be, no, I'll I'll be I'll Mr. MS. I'll be like, come, come over here. I've got a nice yeah. warm seat for you. So Bring your book. <laughs> it's not quite as easy as dialing up and down bonuses aggressively, which controls staff costs, which means you don't have to lay people off when times are hard. Mm. Um, it's not quite as straightforward as that. But look, bonuses will be way down on last year, of course, which means their staff costs will significantly reduce without them having to go through what a, maybe a traditional company might need to do, which is lay off a you know, much bigger chunk of the workforce, you know, 10, 20 percent of the workforce kind of thing. They, they won't do that. Mm. Um, but bonuses in the UK, I mean, well, I should say Europe. I mean, I, I'm two minds with this one because I, I fully agree with, it's been a real, like if you take banking and how it's performed in Europe versus banking and how it's performed in the US in the last 20 years, and the US have smashed it. And Europe is, is a dead, dying dinosaur, right? It's true. And part of the reason, and there's a few reasons, but certainly one of them, we, didn't, we don't help ourselves on an international competitive stage. We don't ham you know, we've just hampered ourselves by putting in place these caps, which means talent mm. goes away because they're getting better deals elsewhere, which is on the one hand a bit a bit stupid so i do agree on that respect with this change now don't get me wrong the argument's nowhere near as simple as that and like when you're looking down onto politically and looking at main street and thinking about the rich poor divide then it's disgusting the amount of money that 
some of these people earn. I mean, it, it really is. And politically, the timing of this announcement from the UK government, who the hell is in charge over there? What, why, what benefit is there mm. in making this announcement now? I mean, if you were to try and plot, pick a moment in time in the last 20 <laughs> years, when would be the worst possible time to make this announcement? It's probably now. So the upside, you talk about internally, okay, this appeases the kind of Eurosceptic right-wing side of the Conservative Party. I get that, but who cares? No one cares about maybe that. Maybe he, so aren't they set to announce a more detailed budget and perhaps there's some proposals they want to squeeze through that are yes. in that budget. And this is pre-positioning to soften some of the critics to yep. get what the government wants, basically, to vote. So it's all again. Yeah, maybe. Let, let's disregard the entire national population. Yeah. About appeasing certain pockets of members within the Conservative Party to get a job done. Yeah. True. Anyway, look, I, I, I think it's I think it's the right thing to do from uh look, because the UK is so dependent on the financial sector, right? Mm. It's it's like 25% of our economy. We're not messing about here. This is the biggest thing we have. And so, right, let's use Brexit as the opportunity to try and make some changes to make us, you know, competitive to attract talent. That that makes complete sense to me. Which which you've also mentioned before about technology, right? And the way the tech right. sector operates. Yeah. We're trying We're, to attract fintech talent and so forth. Exactly. There needs to be way... I, I think this, this leadership change within the Conservatives is that kind of fresh start, clean slate. And... And let's just make some bold decisions to increase our competitiveness and attract talent. It's, it's a no-brainer. Um, so from that regard, I think it's true. But like with the with the bonus cap, though, right? That two times salary. This came in years and years ago after the financial crisis. But what the banks did to get around it was, oh well, it's you can only give a two times salary. Okay, well to avoid people going to the US. Um, let's just make their salaries bigger mm. so that then a two times bonus actually is still a lot of a lot of money. And they were kind of forced into raising base salaries, um, which really then makes it harder for these banks to dial up and down their staff costs in line with the kind of economic cycle. Another reason why Europe's been lagging, they haven't had that agility that maybe the Goldman's in the US have had in terms of dialing things up and down. Um, so they kind of left with that high salary bases. Um, so now you lift the cap. The ideal for these banks would be, right, well, let's go back to the old model, lower bases, and then yes, more bonuses, but only if you earn it and you perform well. But of course, you can't lower people's base salaries because again, they'll just go somewhere else. Right. So they've kind of... <laughs> It's going to take a few years mm. for this to kind of normalize, I would say, with base salaries not going up, but kind of bonus levels rising if you if you deserve it. You know, it's a meritocracy after all, right? Mm. Big, big bonuses aren't guaranteed. So let's move on to the next topic, and that is the inflation data we had out of the states earlier this week and what did cause then a big collapse of the u.s stock market in fact the dow closed down over 1200 points as the worst day of the year by by quite some distance so here's i know you did a, a post about this to the community talking about uh, the kind of difference between what mainstream media were latching onto comparative to what you and people in the market evidently were looking at so perhaps you could explain that. Yeah, I mean, inflation is a tricky one because there's so many different ways of measuring it. I mean, inflation is just the rate at which the price of goods is changing over time. But uh, lots of different ways. Like, So um, there's like PCE, CPI, RPI. Um, so lots of different kind of moments in that kind of life cycle of a product being purchased when you can, can say, right, what's the price? Um, uh, the, the preferred, like, 
When from, from a market point of view, I mean, we're obsessed with the Fed and what are they doing with interest rates? And of course, they're raising rates super fast because of inflation. So what's a really important thing to think is, well, what does the Fed do when they're assessing inflation? What are they most interested in? What are they most closely looking at? And their preferred measure, and they tell us this, their preferred measure of inflation is something called PCE. Um, now, this is just looking at the price of goods changing slightly earlier in that kind of purchase cycle, if you like. So they're looking at the price of goods that businesses are selling at. Um, CPI, which is the data we had on Tuesday, um, that's consumer price inflation. And that's looking at the price of goods um, that consumers are buying at. Okay, you know, businesses selling at like wholesale prices, right? Versus consumers uh, buying uh, uh, kind of retail prices. Um, so anyway, there's this PCE figure, but I'm just going to park that because for September's Fed meeting, which is next uh, a week, next week, right? Or yeah. is it the week? Yeah, yeah. wow, Eight, that's come days. up fast. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so the Fed's meeting next week, That the PCE inflation reading for August doesn't come out until after the Fed's meeting. It's actually next Friday, right? So let's forget that for now, but it's important to understand that is the Fed's preferred measure. But Tuesday's report is like the next most important measure of inflation, which is CPI, consumer price inflation. Now with that one, there's also, again, several different ways of skinning it. We have the headline inflation, which is just taking everything. And when I say everything, I mean, they have a basket of goods, okay? And these are goods that consumers will buy and spend money on, typically in an average consumer's life, day to day, what are you spending money on? Let's bung everything in this basket and let's measure the change in price of the total basket each month. And how, how does the total price change compared to the month before and compared to the year before? So we talk about month on month inflation and year on year inflation, okay? Um, the headline reading came in at 8.3%. That was higher. This, this one was a bit confusing because it's higher than expected, but lower than the previous month. So you got a bit from a kind of trading point of view and a, like a market reaction point of view. That's a tricky middle ground there because, well, all right, it's higher than we were expecting, but at least it's lower than last month. And therefore showing that we've had a few months of headline inflation on an annualized basis dropping. Okay. Well, one, one thing I'd add to that as well, I know you'll talk about the, the core part of this, but yeah. one thing just about the headline was that nearly every piece of market related information I read heading into that report, they were all one sided talking about this is why you'll get a downside surprise today. So I actually think that compounding what <laughs> you'll discuss on the core side was the fact yeah. that the market positioning was highly inappropriate for what was the, as the market thought, going to be a very highly unlikely probability of inflation going up. And, it was, and that's it a really important, blindsided. And that's a really important point. I'll talk about core in a sec. That's a really important point when you're understanding the massive market reaction we had. Mm. Biggest oh, yeah. down day for a couple of years. Because what people have been thinking for the last six weeks, as stock markets have been going back up, they've been thinking, Inflation expectations have peaked. The Fed's, uh, the, the kind of rate of Fed hiking has peaked. The, 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 the last couple of meetings, 75 basis point hikes, that was the highest, that's the worst. In September, they're going to hike at 50 basis points. November, maybe 25. Who knows, by the end of the year, they might have ended their hiking cycle. And maybe they might start cutting because we've got a recession. Wow, right. So stocks have been going up and up and up for six weeks. Boy, were they wrong. Mm. Okay, this inflation report in one instant just scratched that whole argument out. Mm. And, and, it's, and, and uh, let's talk about core, because this is where it's at. This is why it's really important. So core CPI takes out food and energy. Okay, And, the, and historically and traditionally, why do they do that? Because uh, food and, and energy, typically the price of that stuff is more governed by the supply side factors. You're seeing it in energy at the moment, obviously, with the 
um, Russia-Ukraine crisis, that, that supply side spiking energy prices up. Okay, The point there is interest rates from the central bank have zero effect on supply side inflation because interest rates are supposed to control demand side inflation. That's prices going up or down driven by consumers spending money, right? Here, interest rates going up means borrowing is more expensive, consumers spend less, so demand drops and then you dampen inflation, okay? Um, so core inflation is a better read on whether this inflation problem is entrenched. Is it a broad-based inflation problem where the price of everything's going up? You know, earlier in the year, it was really energy and food, right? But now core and the reading came in at 6.3%, higher than expected, right? So the same as the headline, higher than expected. But what's really important about this core reading is it had been trending lower for five months. Okay, it went from a peak in March at 6.5. It dropped to 6.2, then 6, then 5.9, 5.9. Suddenly, bang, popped to 6.3. We're on the way back up. Core CPI was trending down. It's now flipped and it's going back up. And here's the big concern. Is this now the beginning of a second wave of sustained upside in core inflation. If it is, then the Fed are definitely not done. And in fact, they might even accelerate the rate of hiking. You've got people now talking about a 1%, a 100 basis point hike next week. Yeah, and the probability of that presently is 24% as far as implied right. probability is concerned in the, sh the short end of rates. And that figure, I think, got up to about 40%. Yeah. Um, at one point in the depth of the sell off that we had earlier in the in the week. Yeah. I don't know. I, I can't decide. I, I, I think they'll probably go. I don't know. That core readings really concerning. I, I think they'll stick to 75 and they might do then another 75 um, in November. That'll take rates to four um, percent. Right. And talking about start to bring in the fours on yeah. rates the hedge fund manager ray dalio which many will be familiar with of um, bridgewater said that u.s rates at four and a half percent would lead in his opinion to a near 20 percent drop in equity prices if we got to that point so his rationale was that investors may still be too complacent about long-term inflation he said that while bond markets suggest traders are expecting an average annual inflation rate of 2.6% over the next decade, his guesstimate is that the increase will be more around 45 to 5%, i.e. double over the longer term. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, 20% doesn't sound that big a figure when you think about, I mean, how much are we off the high that we were trading? I mean, we're... Yeah. Well, beyond that point already. So it's kind of... Um... Well, he means 20% from here, right? Right, yeah. Which I'm just looking at like the S&P. I'll do some super quick math. Because uh, we're trading, let's just round it to 39. We're trading at 3,900, right? So that'd be a 780 point sell-off would be another 20% down. Okay. So 780, that would take us to 3,100. And when then we that would be... 31. Sorry. When were we last trading 3100? Uh, last trading 3100 uh, in uh, July 2020. Obviously, we mm. COVID took us down and back. The pre COVID high was at 3375. Big drop, big bounce. So, yeah, um, July 2020 was the last time it was 3100. Um, so, and 3,100 from a, from a sell-off from top to bottom, because the peak was 4,800 mm. down to 3,100. That's mm. 1,600. What's the maths on that? That's like it's probably 30, not quite. 30, yeah, it's about 30%. Now, this leads me into an interesting uh, uh, angle. Mm. 
that third, I, I've just done that quick maths and I'm probably wrong on that. Don't, don't. Yeah. So, so what, what's the historical that? precedence? Should I be a buyer right. at 30%? Right. So I was listening to a guy called Peter Oppenheimer, mm. who's this dude from Goldman Sachs, a very notable macro analyst. Um, and he was talking about this stuff and it was really interesting how he broke it down. Um, and I want to talk about two sides of what he was saying. So number one is, what types of bear markets do we have? Because there are different types, and he categorized three, mm -hmm. right? And what, what one are we in now? Okay. And then secondly, what are the typical um, factors you need to see in place before you can be confident that we've hit the bottom, the bear market's over, and right, the next bull market's going to begin? Okay. So on the bear market types, there's three, structural bear market, cyclical bear market, and event-driven bear market. We're in the cyclical one, in his opinion, and I, I think I agree. Structural is the worst. This is your big, giant, bubble-bursting disasters, like the Depression in the 1930s, like the dot-com bubble bursting in 2001. This is typical, the financial crisis in 2008. Typically, from a stock market point of view, you're looking at at least a 60% down, okay, top to bottom. Um, normally takes about three years to, to unfold. And because the, the, the drop in value is so great, typically takes on average about a decade to recover, mm -hmm. i.e. for the stock market to get back to levels that it was at pre-downturn, pre okay? Um, so this is typically yeah, associated with asset price bubbles and equities and real estate, you know, rising private sector debt and massive over leverage and it all kind of blows up, okay? Event driven, well, that's when you have a shock event. So COVID, perfect example, right? Before COVID, actually, the economy was doing pretty well. Uh, certainly in the US, it was gathering momentum. We were thinking about rate hikes and then bang, out of nowhere, massive downturn, okay? Here, though, it's short and sharp. Typically, stock markets sell off 30% on average for an event-driven bear market. But then they, because it comes off so quickly, it tends to take six to 12 months, it rebounds really quickly as well. Okay, so COVID is a perfect example of an event-driven bear market. Finally, it's cyclical. And this is kind of where we're at now, in his opinion, Peter Oppenheimer. And this is just an, a normal, a more normal um, economic cycle-driven bear market recession. Um, and this is typically where, you know, in the economic cycle, you, you tend to get, well, you know, when the economy is growing and growing and growing, and you reach full employment. So the unemployment rates dropping and dropping and dropping. And then what typically happens is consumer consumption is rising and rising, and it leads to inflation going up. And then the central bank have to come in and hike rates to stop inflation going up. Normally, the central bank's too late, and so they hike too late, and inflation becomes too high, and this leads to a consumer consumption-driven recession because prices are now too expensive and people can't afford to buy as much anymore. Here, you typically get a 30%. On average, this is, and this is going back decades and decades and decades, going back like 100 years of analysis on bear markets. On average, you get a 30% drop in stocks on a cyclical bear market. So going back to Ray Dalio at Bridgewater, mm -hmm. his point about 20% from here very cleanly ties into that long-term average of stock market downside in a cyclical bear market. Um, now, when, does, when do we know the bear market's over? When, do the, right. uh, the, <laughs> when, when should you start buying? Um, and clearly in the summer, because in bear markets, you typically get bear market rallies. And we've just had one, a big one. And these bear market rallies can be really big, and it's not uncommon. You get at least one bear market rally in every bear market. Sometimes it's way more than one. In the dot-com bubble bursting, mm. there were six bear market rallies, where the right. bear market rallies at least 15%. And it typically lasts about a month and a half. On average, it's exactly what's just happened. 15% rally in a month and a half. Um, but what Oppenheimer was saying in his analysis, the four things he looks for 
to say, right, the bear market's done. This is the worst point we're buying. He needs four things. He needs valuations to become very depressed. He, so that's company valuations, looking at simple things like price to earnings ratios and so on. The, he needs the rate of um, deterioration of growth and profits um, to the, the rate at which profit levels are dropping, the rate needs to start slowing. Not necessarily profits have declined to their maximum, but the rate at which they're slowing, sorry, the, weight at, the rate at which it's falling starts to decline means we're approaching a bottom on kind of margin squeezes. Number three, policy rates. So central bank rates and inflation expectations need to peak. So that's kind of what happened in the summer. Mm. We thought rate expectations and inflation expectations had peaked. This is the worst. Great, let's start buying. Except this inflation print and Powell's comments at Jackson Hole reversed all of that. So our inflation expectations haven't peaked now. We're now worried it's going to get worse. And then secondly, very depressed negative sentiment and negative positioning. So I guess what we had pre-summer rally, we didn't have all of those four things lining up. Certainly on valuations in the US, the valuations of US companies are still above the long-term average. Above, never mind being very depressed, they're above average. So that's a key factor in this whole thing around, uh, is this bear market rally over or not? Well, from the valuations point of view, no way. Um, and then, as I've said, we still, our, our inflation expectations haven't peaked yet. Um, and also with the rate of recession, I mean, PMIs, we look, we look at, Purchasing Managers Index, it's a lead indicator for future economic activity. They haven't, certainly and again in the US, they haven't declined that much. They, they haven't declined to levels that are normally conducive for a recession. And it's, and it's normally when your PMIs trough. Hmm. That's again another sign, right, this is the worst moment. Okay, let's start buying. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I like having a bingo card. <laughs> Take them off. And um, yeah, I like his last point. That was the one that I was talking about a few weeks ago, where just when everyone is so bearish, market positioning becomes so overtly one directional. Right. Like that yeah. just makes me think, no, nah, I've got to take the other side of that. Yeah. And so you could say we did have that. That was one of the big. We, we almost had like, yeah, yeah. half of those. Um, right. Exactly. Not, we haven't got the full suite where you can be more confident. And this is about conviction rates then, isn't it? Yeah. Um, because you know, this guy's very good. That doesn't mean he's going to be right. And so yeah. as much as these are good signals, um, what's nice is to have some kind of structural way of making that decision, I guess, which is great. Um cool. Well, look, let's um let's just jump to Lehman's. And you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see I am wearing a green hoodie. And I'll start with my story. <laughs> and there's a reason why I'm wearing a green hoodie. And that's because I remember, uh, so we at the time were working in an office, a company I worked for in London Wall. London Wall is one of the kind of main streets in the city of London, where you've got the Deutsche Bank kind of head office, JP Morgan, I think asset management are just around the corner. There's a few other uh, big banks within that location. And this was right at the peak of the hatred for bankers yeah so this is when every day it was the papers obviously the the main thing here was is that the fault of the bankers and the speculative risk taking has created this impact for everyone and so <laughs> i remember um there was a northern rock outside our um <laughs> our building and i think the day before the public um, being very angry at what had happened because Northern Rock was one of the ones that collapsed, mortgages and so forth. Someone threw a brick through the Northern Rock office on London Wall. They stormed the building and started basically looting it at the time. Um, 
and there were similar type of activities happening in London at the time. I think there was a Barclays retail um, shop front that a number of them got vandalized, windows smashed. This was literally the public, we've had enough of this, and the anarchy started to pick up. So we got a memo from the building, the building, and it said, from tomorrow, no one is to come to work in suits, trousers, or shirts. <laughs> Everyone is to come in nondescript clothing of your choosing, preferably hoodies or anything so that you don't get lynched when you're walking to work. And you were like, really? And so for the period thereafter, for a few weeks until the dust settled, we all had to go into work dressed like I am now so that we wouldn't get lynched. And one of the traders, because back then there are a couple of fruity characters on the trading floor. <laughs> and I distinctly remember when all of this was at its worst, he got his Ferrari Tessarossa <laughs> and drove it through the city. I hope someone Open threw a brick. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, that was a, a funny, funny time to live in. But yeah, I mean, it was really quite frightening at the time. You thought that people yeah. were literally what, gonna. What, what gonna was the it. name? What was the name of that that kind of movement? That anti-finance. Um, it had a name, it, and it used to happen on the May Day, wasn't it? Like the first of May. So anyway, there was a name of um, Occupy Wall Street. That's right, exactly. Occupy yeah. Wall Street. Yeah. Um, and it was, yeah, it was dangerous going to work, like literally. I mean, you, you've got to say at the time, fair enough from the public's <laughs> point of oh, view yeah. to be seriously pissed off. Mm. Um, but I remember my, because uh, I worked in Canary Wharf at that time, um, and I was trading for a, a US company in, in Canary Wharf. And it just so happens that the address of my office in Canary Wharf was 50 Bank Street. Okay, 50 Bank Street, Canary Wharf. Guess who was at 25 Bank Street, Canary Wharf? Lehman Brothers. Yep. So, well, I was going to say, you might remember, I mean, Ant, you'll remember. I don't know whether our listeners are old enough to remember, but one of the, you know, the iconic images of the crisis was Lehman Brothers staff Hmm. You know, walking out of the building with their boxes of all their belongings from their desk because the bank had just collapsed. And everyone literally, sorry, guys, you don't have a job anymore. And it were very iconic, you know, photos of Lehman staff tracking out of the building, filing out big queues with their boxes. And I, I, I saw it happening. It was on Bank Street in Canary Wall. Actually, I think I, I think I've seen a photo with someone who looks distinctly like you scoffing down a Greg sausage roll in the background <laughs> in Canary <laughs> Wall. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it was very, um, and it was really, I have to say, what like working in finance. I don't know, just generally, it was really scary. And it, talking about the different bear markets, that was a structural bear market when it feels like the world is ending. Like we, we felt like the banking system globally was going to collapse. I mean, to, to kind of, to put some, to, to give you, to, to, to give a quantitative value on that, go and read up about the Citigroup share price because that fell, I think pre, pre-financial crisis, it was like 600 bucks per you know six hundred dollars per share biggest bank in the world and in in february or start of march 20 2009 it dropped below one dollar um and that's because that's because we thought everything was going bankrupt talking get back to goldman's earlier on and so lehman's was a broker dealer right there were big there were five big broker dealers okay you might have heard of some of these goldman's and morgan stanley then the infamous Lehman's, Merrill Lynch, and Bear Stearns. And these were the guys that were on the trading side taking aggressive risk, okay? Too much risk, it turns out. They couldn't quantify or measure the risk they were taking until it was too late and it all imploded. Uh, Bear Stearns was going bankrupt. They had to get the government forced, basically, JP Morgan, to buy Bear Stearns. I think they bought them famously for $1. Mm. 
Okay, so Bear Stearns got absorbed into J.P. Morgan because it was going down. Um, Merrill Lynch was going bankrupt, and that got and Bank of America came in and absorbed them. And then Lehman's was next, and Lehman's um, had done a deal with Barclays in the UK. Barclays were going to basically absorb Lehman Brothers and prevent them from going bankrupt, except then the UK government stepped in. And this was over the weekend, because the deal was done on Friday with Barclays. Over the weekend, the UK government said, nope. The chancellor, the classically named Alistair Darling, uh, vetoed it and said, we are not, you're, we're not allowing you to do this deal. We won't let you import US toxic banking. Um, so Lehman's went bankrupt. The next week, Morgan Stanley were two days away from going bankrupt. Goldman's were five days away, like measuring it based on their mm -hmm. cash, right? Morgan Stanley were two days. They were next. And they did a deal with, I think it was the Saudis, the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, then the Fed came in and basically forced these banks to take on a commercial banking license, which ended this broker-dealer thing. If you're a broker-dealer, there was much less regulation. They mm -hmm. forced them to take a commercial banking license. This gave them access then to the Fed's emergency overnight lending window, mm -hmm. which then provided them with the capital to stay alive. Um, and so that's why Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are still here today. They were, a, they were five days away from death. It was literally that bad. And that's mm. a structural bear market for you. Yeah, I still, one of the most memorable squawks I can remember of my career was when a so big part of the value add that we had in our service was the rumor mill. So we'd have the yeah. ear of certain people, and we'd get wind of things before it hit the, the main kind of street, if you like. And that would be your edge from an information perspective. And this, this message came through from someone who was a high quality contact. And he said, Barclays cash points going to be empty nationwide by 4 p.m. No wow. more cash. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> part, of, part of me was like, I need to get down to Barclays right now. Yeah. But then I looked, I remember at lunchtime at Barclays, there was already a queue a of hundreds of people trying yeah. to max clip deposit, take it out, which was already collapsing the share price. <laughs> the monster outflows that are happening as the share price was getting killed. But I actually had to say that on the microphone. And I remember Barclays shares just getting hammered along with every bank's shares. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Time. But yeah. Wow. All right. Well, look, fun memories. Indeed. Happy 14th anniversary. We're still alive <laughs> and, and well. So, uh, yeah, look, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Hopefully, that was uh, an interesting episode. As I said before, please do. Uh, help us push out the pod to as many people as possible. We're at 261 ratings on Spotify. So let's see if we can hit that 300 marker by the episode next week and 124 on Apple. Let's gun for 150 there as well. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Piers, and have a great weekend, everyone. Have a good weekend.